with Hive World for May, oh, sorry, June 1st. Um, a special shout out to all those new clients who are joining us to learn how to put their nucleus that they receive from us into their hive when they get it. And for those of you who have successfully overwintered a colony, congratulations and a little update on how the colony should be looking and what the colony has been doing over the past week. Um, we unfortunately had to um, cancel Meet the Beekeeper because of uh, bad weather, which was a long weekend. And uh, I just closed the door here where we got some swallows nesting inside the building, so I just had to open it again. Um, but uh, and weekend, we had the opportunity to get out nucleus to demonstrate me that we couldn't because of the weather. So, again tonight, we're going to put a nuke into a full-sized hive, give a bit of a demonstration on how that works. Go in here and be right with you. So for those of you who have probably noticed, there is a very significant amount of dandelions around. And um, I think from some records that I've been keeping over the last 10 years in our area here in Alberta, and certainly down to the Calgary region, this would be one of the most prolific years that the dandelions have been. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because of the depth of snow that we had this year. So the deeper the snow, the more likely we are to have a much more abundant crop of dandelions. Now, we get some idea of how successful those dandelions are. When we look at the hive scale data of what the bees are actually producing off this dandelion crop. Now this particular dandelion crop this year, uh, for an overwintered hive, which may be in your yard right now, probably producing somewhere in the region on a decent flying days probably producing somewhere in the region of three to four pounds of nectar and pollen a day now our overwintered hive yesterday produced 4.4 pounds um, of nectar and pollen and we're going to go in and take a look at that and I'll hopefully we'll be able to show you some of the results of that and we're just making sure we've got the smoker going well because tonight is not great weather I'm just a little bit concerned with But uh, yeah, four, four pounds yesterday, very, very decent flying conditions, lovely conditions, un uninterrupted flight, and the bees are able to bring a tremendous amount of pollen to sustain the, uh, the bees are uh, stimulating the queen into. So your average overwinter colony with the dandelions in this northern Alberta region, probably similar in the Calgary region, would be somewhere in the region of around that two, two and a half, three, four pounds if you've got a very heavy hive. Just giving a little bit of smoke here. Hopefully you guys can hear well. And we'll just crack the two boxes here and take a look at what the gap looks like between the two boxes. Again, this is June the 1st, and last week we made sure that we had the correct number of brood. Dry the frames down. Yeah, you guys can see in there, good number of frames, and good activity with the bees. So 
they've still got a ways to go up here. Uh, some good dandelion pollen coming in, nectar. Second frame in. And the uh, third frame in, we can see it's pretty much built out like a lovely louder. You can see here the shiny cells here are the nectar. This is the second frame in, the shiny cells are the nectar. And the dark cells are the dandelion pollen and coming in in quite significant profusion. One of the things we can be sure of is, is that a colony that's able to bring in four pounds of nectar and pollen in 24 hours, uh, it's a very, very large colony. And you can see here, we're on, we're on the third frame in at the top box, and we've got uh, a whole frame here of larvae. If you look real careful there, if I keep still, you should be able to see the larvae. And the reason we've just used smoke on these bees is because Quite simply, the, the smoke is not a weapon. The smoke is a signal. And so smoke sends a signal to the bees to, uh, that our hive is about to burn down. And so they instinctively go directly to um, uh, open honey cells and take a big drink. And taking a big drink very much calms the bees down, almost like they're about to go on a swarm. Here's another, here's another example. This is the fourth frame in. We've got a lovely crown of cat brood in the center and around it we've got larvae. And around that, close by, we've got stores of honey that the bees are storing from the dandelions. That's our fourth frame in. And then we reach the fifth frame. And again, we've got a nice little, we've got some presence of drone brood, which is a good sign, good, good sign for the, uh, good sign for the hive. And then we've got a lovely frame of cat brood there in the top box. This bee, this hive is going to go through quite a significant um, explosion of population over the next three or four weeks, which is what we need prior to the honey flow. Now into the seventh frame, and again we've got a cat brood. We've got eggs. So for those of you who've joined us last week, and we checked how much uh, how much um, brood we had to make sure that we didn't have a large enough hive, too large a hive for this time of the year. Um, this this uh, hive is filling out nicely with cat brood and larvae and eggs at the right time of the year so that it crests in population at the right time just before the honey flow which is in uh, we're anticipating around July 7. And now here we are out to the almost the ninth frame and you can see a lovely clear dandelion honey coming into the hive. So for those of you who've got the overwintered hive Again, make sure that you don't have too much brood. And last week we were uh, we were advising on, you know, five to seven frames of brood. That includes cat brood and uh, cat brood and larvae and eggs. Just lift this guy off here and take a look downstairs. So here we are downstairs now, and just start from the outside frame as we did last week. Look at what we have. Cleaning the outside frame up. And my uh, base is rocking here a bit. Oh, because I've lost a little, little leveling stone, it looks like. Oh, yeah, they've got lots of room to build. So when these bees all hatch out that we were just looking at, a tremendous amount of room for the, the bees to... Um, working. And here we are downstairs, we've got a lovely frame of cat brood, and we've got the uh, queen laying eggs. So we know she's been here at least in the last three days. 
because eggs take three days to hatch, so we know that she's we know that she's been there. <clears throat> and then the center frame here, we have our sensor, so we know what temperature the brood nest is at. And if you know what temperature the brood nest is at, you know for sure if the queen has been present and if she's been laying. So again, here's a good example for you. Lovely frame of cat brood. We haven't seen the queen yet, and often into June we don't see the queen. For the simple reason that the population of the hive is so large, that finding her isn't necessarily the, uh, the easiest thing. We've got the bees working another frame of cat brood. Lots of young, fuzzy looking bees. And there's the bees working this further frame of cat brood. So yeah, this, this hive is going to go into a very significant explosion of population over the next two to three weeks. And now we're on to the next frame and it looks like we have a pollen frame. And nectar frame. And then we've got lots of room downstairs here for the bees to grow into and fill. Yep, so we've got the bees filling out here. It's interesting that the bees have skipped over a frame and they've started to fill nectar on the next frame. And that's the intelligence of the bees realizing how big the brood nest is going to get. So instead of doing a whole bunch of work twice, the bees have got the intelligence to Put the honey the next frame over because they know the bees and the queen are going to require that space in a couple of weeks time. I didn't see the queen but the bees are pretty relaxed here so I'm just going to put the lid temporarily on here to keep them in there and quiet and we'll just take another quick look through this frame make sure is doing okay. We've got good stores coming in so they have a, some good flying weather so they're able to fly together and that's important for those new beekeepers to understand is, is that one of the things we're really concerned about here at Hive World is, is that uh, when we deliver bees to customers we, we must have some guarantee that the days after we deliver the bees to the clients that the bees are going to be able to fly well. Because if the bees are not able to fly well in those days after we deliver, because of the stress of delivery, the bees can actually perish very quickly, even even with a feeder on. Because especially for new beekeepers, if you haven't quite got the touch or the uh, the timing right, it can be that uh, the bees actually perish uh, with with all good intentions. So um, we. Uh, Watch the weather very carefully to make sure that we can uh, provide bees to customers so that they can, the bees can fly directly after they've been delivered to the customer. And we're just taking a look here to see where the queen might be operating and we, we don't see her yet. So we know that she's here because there's eggs. And we also know she's here because the bees are quiet. Now if this, if this hive sounded more like a furnace fan, and we would know that the queen was missing and the bees would be protesting and trying to tell us that. Oh, and there she is. So she's on this frame here and I'll bring it over and see if I can point her out to the best of my ability. There she is. Just right there. Walking on this cat brood. She did have a red crown on her because she's last year's queen. and She's our breeder queen actually for this year. Very long, dark back. She's a Russian hybrid Varroa hygienic queen. We haven't treated this hive for Varroa now for a couple of years. You can see her walking around there on the on the frame. So we know she's present and we know she's laying. And we also know that she's very, a very good queen because her cat brood is absolutely solid with very, very few missed cells in the area where she's laying. There she is there again.
Okay, so we'll put this back together and we can move on to our next segment about how to install a nucleus into a into a hive. So again, strong double story colony. Um in great shape about June the 1st. Approximately seven to eight frames of brood in the whole colony. Um, queen laying, and then more importantly, is, is that there is ample room. I'm going to level up my colony here, but it seems to. There we go. Um, plenty of room for the queen to lay because she's got some of her best laying days ahead of her over the next three weeks prior to July the 1st. There's no feed on here and there's no pollen paddies. One thing we can do today, for those of you who've got overwinter colonies, not for those of you who have got nucleuses because the nucleuses are too weak, is you can now remove your entrance reducers because the bees are in uh, good enough shape with sufficient numbers inside the hive to be able to defend the colony if there was any sort of an attack, which is extremely rare at this time of the year because uh, all the other insects, the wasps, the mice, they've got plenty of them to go at, so there's not really necessarily a concern of predators. We're just uh, in the area where you can't see here, folks. We're just giving the nucleus a little smoke. I'm just going to go get the hive box. I'll just switch the camera here so we can see what's going on. I'll just grab the hive. So for those of you who are new, um, when you receive your nucleus, uh, set the nucleus box down at the location where your hive will fly all summer. So the reason for that is to allow the bees to fly out of this box. Now, for those of you who've got a busy schedule, this box is designed specifically with you in mind. You've got a few days that you can, uh, you've got a few days that you can, you know, wait before you actually have to put your, um, bees inside your inside your hive so we've set it down here and we're going to put this uh, hive into this little small eight frame box which i have here <clears throat> and we've got an entrance reducer at the front and it's evening time so we're just going to pull this forward from where it has been and we're going to slide this hive hive into its place roughly And I'm just going to remove this tape that I put on here because there were some rubber bees in this box earlier today. So we just secured it for the drive. And we've got our feeding pail ready to go on here. When we're done. And now what we're going to do is, is we're going to open up the hive here by inserting the hive tool between the screen bottom board. And there we go. And uh, I think that's what's really cool is, is that the rim of this nucleus is all yellow from the dandelion honey, dandelion pollen that the bees have been bringing in while we've been growing them. Now inside your nucleus, it's not important necessarily that if you've got a number of them, if you bought five or six, it's not necessarily important that there are all the same necessarily. It's not important that they all weigh the same either. What's important is, is, is as we go through here and we put these bees into the box, is that 
the, it has the, the, a certain amount of brood for the time of year. And we're going to just take a look at that right now. So yeah, we've got some straggler bees here, it looks like. We've hitched a ride. Let's take a look. And uh, maybe we'll just take one more out so that we've got five frames here. And then what we always do is you start on the outside of the nucleus box where you've got the most amount of room to work. And you're going to find a frame that the bees are working on. And this is a really important frame. This is a frame where the queen has begun to lay in, but also it gives the bees something to do. Somewhere to store the honey. Somewhere to begin, like, for the queen to begin laying if they remain in shipment any, any length of time. But it also provides just simple occupational therapy for the bees, which is really, really critical while we transport nukes. And I can see in here that the queen has laid every available space that they've built with eggs on the one side. On the other side, they've just begun to build out the frame. So we're going to put these frames back into the new hive here in exactly the same order that they came out. Now, one of the things you'll notice by doing it in this time of the evening is that there's just bees just make zero protest like it's the bees love it it, it works really well and um, the bees really appreciate you know not being forced around too much uh, and causing all kinds of concern and worry and I'm looking here for eggs and I see the queen she's here the queen is loose in your nucleus so that she can continue to lay on the journey see her here and we got eggs and we got uh, larvae Let me a quick blow here to see yeah yeah every available space that the bees have provided for this queen is laid so there we have one two three sides of brood already we've got eggs and then we got larvae on two sides and then we got a complete frame of cat brood so that's four another one complete one of cat brood Really wonderful nucleus. So that's four. And then we have another frame of completely covered over cat brood. And another one of cat brood and eggs. And it even looks like this particular one we have. Yeah, we have a tremendous amount of cat brood. It's really good. And then our final frame on the outside should be one of honey, which it is. So full of honey and pollen and really vital stores. And in the bottom of your nucleus, you're going to see a um, collection of dead bees down here. And then the bees may have begun building some wax on the outside of your box. But otherwise, you've got some really, really good... Uh, You've got some really good uh, space here that you can use to create a nucleus yourself. If you keep the lid and the screen top, you can use this in the future with a hole at the front to make a one of your own queens or something. So there we are. Pretty simple installation of your five frame nucleus into your hive. And over the next 10 days, the hive will explode in population as the bees begin to hatch out of those frames that we described. Now, regardless of where you are in your uh, in the season, and whether you've got an established hive or whether you have a um, whether you have an established hive or whether you have a non-established hive. Um, it's really important that you put on a pail feeder over the top of the inner cover hall until at least June the 21st. And the reason for that is, is because if we have rainy weather, which we're anticipating and which has delayed us significantly this year with being able to deliver nukes to customers, if we're going to have rainy weather, rainy weather is a death sentence to the bees because they can't fly. And if your queen is in maximum laying condition, it means that 
the resources in the hive, just because it's raining, the resources in the hive are not being used less. They're being used as the same as a nice day. The bees demand inside the hive for honey and nectar is very high when the queen is laying so many eggs. More than three days, two or three days in a row of rainy weather, it's very important that the bees are given access to a pail feeder like this so that they can uh, feed and use it as a simulation of a nectar flow. Now, as they receive that and they continue to bring it into the hive, the bees have a general sense of well being and it allows them to communicate to the queen that everything is good and that everything will be fine and keep laying. We can't afford the queen to slow down in laying for any reason prior to July the 7th or July the, between July 7th and July the 15th. We want maximum egg laying conditions to be provided to the queen. And just before we go here, I'm just going to raise this hive up on two bricks, just so we're a little bit further off the ground. <clears throat> we'll just do that by lifting it up here at the back. It will have a couple of other hive configurations where we'll produce some comb honey. So there you have it from Hive World for June the 1st. Quick overview of how your overwinter colony should look. Now, if your overwinter colonies, folks, are bigger than that, strongly suggest to use your nuke box or use a nuke box or another hive and divide your hive because otherwise it's going to swarm. And if your hive swarms in June, you won't get a honey crop. It's not a myth, it's the truth. <laughs> you won't get any honey crop. The bulk of the bees will leave in the swarm. Okay, so if you have questions, we'll, we'll hang around here for a little while and we'll get as many questions answered as we possibly can. Okay, let's start with Murray. So can you explain the use of too much smoke? There is a use of too much smoke. Yeah, one of the things you'll notice when you're using too much smoke is you actually make the bees respond quite heavily with a heavy roaring sound. Um, trying to get the smoke out of the hive, basically. And all you're using the smoke for is to send a message. If you get, some, if you get a couple of good puffs of smoke into, the, into a hive, you won't need to worry too much about getting that message sent, especially if your colony is large, because if your colony is large, the bees communicate the message very, very quickly and very, very effectively. So yeah, you can always tell if you've done too much smoke because they roar at you. They're trying to get the smoke out and it's that's a waste of energy. They need to conserve that energy. There's no need. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, can you use too much smoke? Okay, so Paul, my overwintered hive is looking better. Good, good news. Um, Victoria asks if we purchased our nuke from you this year. Is our queen new this year? Yes, the answer is yes. This is the this is your queen's first spring that she's building up through. Um, migratory lids. So Matt asks about migratory lids. How do you make or get an upper vent without drilling a hole inside the box? Great question. So. Uh, as many of you would know, uh, we also run a um, commercial beekeeping operation at Hive World, and we use uh, pallets that can be lifted up with a forklift that have got four hives on it. And underneath the hive boxes, the pallet actually acts as the bottom box. We'll be able to show, show you this uh, later in the season, but the, uh, 
the, the bottom board is actually the pallet and there are cleats that hold the boxes. And in our bottom boards, we have screen. So we have large areas of our bottom board cut out with screen on them, which acts as the primary ventilation. Now, if you're using a migratory lid, as Matt says, typically speaking, you'd block over the top entrance. And then what do you do as far as an entrance is concerned? And how do you have upper ventilation? Well, the answer is you don't. You provide the ventilation on the bottom board. And for those of you using screen bottom boards, you don't need to worry about providing a significant amount of upper ventilation. As you can see on the hive that we just looked at, um, I don't have an upper ventilation box on it because there is a large, um, well, the whole of the bottom of the board that uh, we have the hive on here is open. Uh, screen bottom board. Now, if any of you have got a screen bottom board that had the tray that pulled in and out, please know that, that tray should be removed, folks. It's not designed to be in there. It's only designed to be in there for the short 24 hour period when you are checking if you had mites or not. So it's a mite counting device and it's just placed in there for 24 hours and then removed. And we leave our mite counting trays out pretty much year round. In fact, we don't even use that mite counting method commercially or on the hives that we have here in the bee yard. We use the shaking method as we've demonstrated on Meet the Beekeeper previously. Uh, Matt asks if the nukes that were delivered were treated before delivery. So the nukes are not treated, folks. It's the hive that they came from was treated through the spring and managed for mites and mite levels. The nucleus is a, is a small version of a full-sized hive, and that full-sized hive was indeed uh, managed and treated. And typically, it's not the spring anyway. It's the fall that's the most important time to make sure that those mites are managed. Uh, whether my, whether your nucleus is bought from purchased from pure uh, from uh, Hive World or anywhere else, uh, please note that it's your responsibility and your obligation to the bees to check your mite levels. We don't know who your neighbours are. If your neighbours around you have got very 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 high mite levels, there's no stopping the drones from visiting from hive to hive through the summer. So it is important that you learn how to test for mites. Don't just buy treatments. Learn how to check for mites. It doesn't take long. Um, okay, Murray asked, how are you putting your lid on on top of the feeder? Great question. So I have another super box which goes on top, Larry. Uh, Murray, sorry. Um, we put another super on around the feeder and then we put the lid on top of the super. So use a super to put on top of your hive so that you can conceal your feeder in there. And Mike asks, I've got two strong hives right now. Should I stop feeding anytime soon? So no, no, the weather, and unfortunately we don't, we're not looking at the next three weeks as being particularly favorable for bees. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've had a little bit of a challenge with our uh, delivery program over the next two weeks, because we are looking at some significant rain uh, excuse the uh, competition here with the coyotes. Um, but uh, you want to make sure you provide feed to the bees. We recommend for at least, till at least the, the 21st, 22nd. Uh, Janice says, I don't have a hole like that in the top of my hive lid. I don't know, Janice. I'm not sure what kind of a hive you have or where you've got it from, but the inner cover should be equipped with a hole for you to feed your bees with an, with an inverted pail. Uh, Larry asks, uh, can you walk me through adding a second brew box? So most of you for, who had an overwinter colony, if you split your colony uh, in the last two or three weeks, then most likely, you would have, should be, most likely you will have put on a second box by now. But once the bees are operating on six to eight frames in your bottom box, you need to be adding the second box for them to work up to, to begin filling out and building out. So you've got that maximum area for the queen to lay through June.
Uh, Ross asks, what's your take on anti-robbing devices, uh, anti-robbing entrance screens, worth the effort? So yes, uh, yes, it is worth the effort. It's not worth the effort, it's essential. Um, but remember, when the colony is in maximum population, which is now, nobody's going to go in there because it's a death sentence if they do. So you don't have a problem with wasps in June. You don't have a problem with wasps in July. You have a problem with wasps once you start having the problem with your picnics. Or when you're outdoors, that's when you have a problem. When you notice wasps, that's when they're going to start to be a problem for the bees. So it's typically August, late August, and into September. Um, uh, robbing is uh, insects that are trying to come into the hive to take honey, and that's what wasps do. Uh, the hornets, however, are going to take your bees. They're not going to take the honey. They're going to come and take the bees, which is extremely rare, and we we have very, very few reports ever of hornets being to such numbers they decimate a hive. There are some uh, really good media stories right now, but certainly not on the prairies. Uh, Mark has asked, why do you recommend a bucket feeder or a frame feeder when move? Okay. So we recommend a bucket feeder upside down, Marcus, because we want every single hive frame in the hive to be used to grow the hive. If you take out two frames to put in a frame feeder, you're down uh, four, four working sides. And that four working sides in the hive and the downstairs and the bottom box is actually nearly 30% of the space the bees can operate on. You don't want to be reducing your brood possibilities in your hive by 30% because you won't just get 30% less honey. You may get 60 to 70% less honey. So you want to use, if in a 10 frame box, you want to make sure you're using... Um, all those frames, and then if you're going to add feed, you add feed from an external source. Uh, Ross asks, when do we take out the entrance reducer on a new nuke? So once the bees are operating on 10 frames, you can remove your entrance reducer because there's sufficient numbers to um, defend the hive. Yeah, so Victoria, good observation. Um, once the colony has grown, um, yes, even once the colony has grown, in order to make sure it continues to grow and we get rainy days, make sure they have feed available. Typically, whether we're in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, after the 21st of June, it wouldn't really, it doesn't really make any difference to feed them or not, because even if we did get, you know, two or three days of rain, the bees are in such numbers that they can gather 15, 10 to 15 pounds of nectar and pollen the next day if necessary, which is like four days worth of stores for the hive. So once we get to June the 21st, so long as the queen has been laying, there's sufficient stores in the hive and sufficient foraging force in the hive, so once the weather turns good, to replace it quick. Uh, Victoria asks, what if you are choosing to do single brew boxes and have eight frames? Okay, good question, uh, Victoria. So... We, we, in our uh, commercial beekeeping operation, we run single brood boxes. But on June the 1st, we add a second brood chamber to all the hives. And then on June the 21st, or 20, between the 21st and 25th, we shake all of the bees and the queen down into the bottom box and put on a queen excluder and put the second box back on. Now, once all the brood is hatched out, matured and hatched out, the honey flow is on. And the bees fill all of those spaces in that second box with honey. And that becomes your first honey super that you remove from the hive. Okay, I hope that helps, folks. Um, thank you again from here in just east of Edmonton and Sherwood Park. This is our Hive World Hands-On location. And Hive World Hands-On is now an official Google location. So you can Google us at Hive World Hands-On. And as soon as we have our social distancing uh, rules figured out and we get some clearance from uh, the county here that we can start some of our normal activities, we will offer our in-person Hive World hands-on sessions on a Saturday between 11 and 1, 1 p.m. In the meantime, our Meet the Beekeeper series at 8 p.m. on a Monday will continue. And... Uh, we will seek to answer questions and take you through what looking and we're certainly shaping up to be um, a really great season. A little bit of a delay with some of the weather we've got coming, 
Um, but as always, our first consideration at Hive World with the bees is the bees. Thank you very much, folks. Have a good night, and we will be back again next Monday, 8 p.m. 